Good afternoon, everybody. I am Beth Coffey. I'm the Programs Director for Northwestern Division. And today um, you're uh, joining a, a suite of, of folks that are gonna um, celebrate Women's uh, History Month. Um, in celebration of the month, we have women leaders from around Northwestern Division from different backgrounds to tell their stories. We represent just a slice of the jobs and the backgrounds um, within NWD and within the core, but we hope that our stories help others. The panel members today will tell you their story or, or their journey through their career and speak to things such as what advice would they give young female employees entering into the workforce knowing what they know today? What lessons have they learned that they would apply um, in your role to support the development of other staff? What are the things that they're most proud of? And what role do they think as a, co as a collective we play in the history of our organization? We welcome all your thoughts and comments and we encourage you within this virtual platform to uh, either raise your hand or um, put a comment in the chat and we'll monitor that as we go through this session. We are recording today's session and we'll probably go a little bit longer than our hour um, just so we can get all the recordings from the panel members that we uh, had volunteered to speak today. So uh, we understand everybody's you know, got other commitments, but you're welcome to stay on for the full time or, um, or leave as you need to. There are some topics and uh, or questions that we may not be able to get to today, um, but we will be capturing all the comments in the chat. So if you put something in there and we're not able to address it, we will follow up with, with people um, after this event. We will post this um, because it is gonna be recorded. And we're also you know, taking this session and the session we did last week and taking ideas for future sessions on different topics. So we encourage any ideas that you might have, um, not just related to Women's History Month, but other types of forums or virtual events that we can do to you know, share ideas um, and work in this kind of virtual collaborative format to help each other to develop um, in our current jobs or into future leaders or wherever you're trying to take your career or life. So I will um, go through our panel members um, here in a moment, but I just wanna do a couple ground rules um, because as we all know within the virtual platform, um, bandwidth can get kind of, uh, kind of wonky so I would just ask if you're not on the panel that you go ahead and um, uh, stop your video. Uh, we will keep, I think everybody's coming in um, muted. So if you, um, you know, if we do have a question or you raise your hand, uh, you'll have to unmute yourself. Um, I do encourage folks to use chat just because it's an easy way to kind of capture the comments today. And then also, like I said, um, take them with us. So the, Panel members I have today, um, I am very honored to have just the, um, this whole group of, of women um, from around the division. So I have Jenny Derrick, she is the DPM for Seattle District. Uh, Nicole Walls, who's the Northwestern Division EEO lead. Ruth Ann Hader, the Northwestern Division Regional Contracting Chief. Sheila Newman, um, our Omaha District Chief of Operations. Jen Richmond, our NWD Chief Counsel. Amy Reese, our Seattle Chief of Operations. Joan Walls, Seattle Chief of Engineering. Liza Wells, the Portland District uh, Engineering and Construction Chief. Uh, Judy Hutchings, who's our NWD Executive Officer. Mona Thomason, our Chief of Northwestern Division Business Management Division. Kate furlong Boris, our NWD uh, HR Chief. And Kelly Doherty, um, our NWD Resource Management Chief. So I, I thank all of the ladies that are um, joining us today. And without further ado, I'm gonna kick this over to my partner in crime, um, Ms. Jenny Derrick, um, to tell her story um, to this group today. So thank you for joining us. Well, now I think I can officially say good afternoon. Um, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my history of my career fairly quickly and then highlight a couple things that I think um, are relevant when I look back. To me, it's been interesting uh, to, to look back and think about how much has changed. And one of the things that really hit me as I listened when we did this before is how much history really has occurred in the years um, that we've, we've worked in, inside of our careers. So let me kind of go back in time. 
I graduated in 1987 with a mechanical engineering degree from Seattle University. At that time, I was the only female in my graduating class. Uh, in grad school, I went off to grad school and I studied there at the University of Washington where I was recruited uh, by the Corps of Engineers. It was a second recruitment. The first time they weren't successful, but the second time they really focused on um, an opportunity for diversity of experience. And they kind of laid out all those different things that you can do when you're working for the Corps. And in, um, when I think about that, I don't think I ever looked back when I made the decision to come on board. So then uh, when I came on board, I was able to uh, work inside the engineering training program for two years and also continue with my studies. I, I was able to rotate through all the organizations and in, that in, at that time included um, HDC down in Portland, um, going out to the operating projects, and uh, even working a little small stint in our IT organization and contracting. I did finally settle down into a very small group. We were going through a reduction in force at the time, and we actually haven't had another reduction in force since then, but it was a small group of seven people who were um, kind of pretty entrepreneurial in nature and were working the cleanup program that was just starting to emerge. We were working with the formerly used defense sites, IRP, and Superfund as the primary business drivers. We had three computers shared between seven people, and we were still working with carbon copies. Our program grew quite a bit. And during that time period, we went from that small group to a large enough organization that we split into parts. Uh, we created a, a project management group that went into PPMD, which was just being formed, and then also a technical organization, which is now the Environmental Engineering and Technology section. I worked there as an as a, um, engineer, where I um, also worked as a project manager on a Superfund site, the Logistics Center at Fort Lewis and as an engineer that designed a, a lot of different cleanups. When I go back and look at those, I'm always surprised what I worked on. Uh, I did, then became the section chief of that group for five years. Uh, after about five years, I was pretty tired, and uh, the person who, I was acting for five years, the person who was in that position had return rights, and I, so I took that as an opportunity to kind of change course a little bit, and I actually backed up and uh, went into um, project management where I was the program manager for the Superfund program and the project manager for Bunker Hill um, out in Idaho. Uh, it was during that time period that I kind of put my head down and I uh, had uh, two children. Uh, those of you um, who know, I had uh, two daughters who are now uh, 19 and 21. Some of you might remember me dragging them along to program meetings and things where they had to suffer through a little bit um, of my travels. Uh, after that, time went by and I realized that I had uh, quite a bit of time on, um, under my belt and that I might actually have some influence and maybe a little bit less focused on, on raising my children. And so I did kind of look up and I, I worked um, uh, with the, bringing on board the um, P2 program. Uh, then I started a set of experiences as a branch chief. So I ended up working in PPMD as a branch chief in all of the business lines, starting with environmental and then military and IIS, <clears throat> and then a, a, a small little rotation through the civil works. And then in two, 2019, I had an opportunity to apply for and was selected for the chief of PPMD. And so for about two years now, I've been the deputy to the district commander and then also um, trying to run um, the, the division. So that's about 33 years in a nutshell, um, 33 years in Seattle District. So one of the things that I always point out to people is that um, my career path was very focused um, within the district. Uh, and what that means is I have, I do have some blinders and I work very hard to try to reduce the blind spots on the side um, by uh, trying to participate in regional or national initiatives. And so I've, I've done that with a, a few things, including uh, a, um, an opportunity um, with Task Force Power, and I'm really glad that I've tried some of those things. Um, so looking back, kind of when I think about what was critical to, to for me um, as, a, as a female in the workplace is the reflection of what it meant to sometimes be the only female in the room. And 
uh, that was my, you know, that's my story, but there's probably, you know, your staff or your coworkers or maybe yourself, you're also a person who's the only in the room, or you know somebody who's an only in the room, and that's maybe who I'm talking to is the people who know somebody who's an, uh, an only. And for me, I love working for the Corps of Engineers, and one of the reasons is, uh, is that my supervisors always had my back. My supervisors um, recognized that um, I needed their support. And an example that I always like to give is Steve Foster. He was the chief of planning at the um, time, and he was also the engineer and training coordinator. And at the very early years, he recognized that women, in particular, were having difficulty in their rotations and having negative experiences with their rotations. So what he started doing is, is uh, sitting down with the, with the organization that he was going to, to put the EIT, talk to them about expectations, and then he talked to me. And he said, these are the things I want you to watch out for, and I want you to let me know if anything plays out. So I went into those experiences, I, I went into those job assignments, and people gave me really quality work, they gave me great mentoring, and I had a positive experience. But I can tell you, the women that were in those jobs who laid the groundwork before me were struggling, and they had some difficulties in their organization, and they were being treated differently. And I felt, you know, I felt on the, really conflicted because I had this support structure and they didn't have it. Um, as the years progressed, I have always worked for men. That's just kind of how it played out. And those men have always provided that support. It was later on that I had a tremendous um, support structure in my colleagues, my peers, um, that I work with that are women, and developed some great relationships where um, we can troubleshoot and try to figure out what we're going to do. But when I look back, it was those people that really helped me out and helped me see where I could be successful in the organization. And you can do that, too, for the only that are walking into the room. Um, so uh, with that, I will, I'm going to turn it over to the next speaker. And what I want to do is introduce Nicole Walls, who's um, the leader of our Divisional um, Equal Employment Opportunity Office. She has about um, 1.5 years in that position. And she tells me that outside of advising the CG, what, she's, what the most important things that she does is she's responsible to assure that EEO programs are functioning properly and that they have the resources they need. So I've enjoyed um, talking to all of you today, and I'll turn that over to Nicole. Thanks. Thanks, Jenny, and uh, thanks to Beth for sending the invitation uh, for me to share a little bit about my story. Um, so I began working for UFACE um, several years ago as a student intern in the engineering library as a step. So not too many people remember what a step student was, but uh, that's where I got my start. Um, and it was very interesting because I got to see that uh, the Corps of Engineers, having known nothing about it <laughs> before I got hired on, did a lot of great things, right? I got to look at law library books and treaties we had with uh, Native American um, uh, uh, tribes and ASTM books and all these things that were that were foreign to me, but it gave me a different viewer perspective of the organization. So I was there for probably about three and a half years before I moved into the EEO office as a SCEP student. So I got promoted from a GS3 to a GS4 and <laughs> worked my way uh, from a student to becoming eventually the EEO officer in the Omaha district for eight years. And like Jenny, I've only worked for youth Um, but in that time I've had extraordinary experiences. I've got to see parts of the United States that most people never will, like beautiful Glasgow, Montana, right? So it's, it's been a great uh, opportunity for me. Now saying that, Oftentimes, I was one of the few women in the room and the only minority in the room or at the table. And that presented its own um, set of challenges, right? Um, it's interesting how people thought it was okay to comment on things like the way I wore my hair or the types of earrings that um, I wore that I don't think if I was a man that would have happened or um, being a person of color, sometimes my hairstyle changed often. 
um, in, in, in different ways that I don't think that um, had I been a different color, people would have um, felt free to express their opinion. That being said, um, some of my mentors who meant a lot to me and, and poured into me were not people of color. It was John Bertino, the engineering chief in the Omaha division, or Katie Shank, who was the um, ops chief um, for Omaha for a long time. And they showed me the organization. They taught me things that had nothing to do with EEO, right, but everything about being a leader, um, being a, a person with a very important position within USAFE. Uh, so uh, a couple of things that I just want to leave you all with, um, you know, what would I, advice would I have for a young female uh, just entering to the workforce today, knowing what I know now? And it, it, it's don't be afraid to say yes and don't be afraid to say no. Uh, sometimes you might have to say no, um, whether it be for your family, um, your, your career, your education, whatever it might be you might have to say no. And there are times when saying yes is a good thing. The most important thing is doing what's best for you. So I'm not mobile. There are personal reasons why I'm not. But I took every opportunity I could when called upon to say yes, right? Whether that be, you know, going to another district to help train a new EEO officer or being asked to work on different PDTs or projects with um, the National EEO Office, you know, I said yes, and it, it enabled me to broaden my horizon, see how other districts did things, see how other divisions did things, and even see how other federal agencies uh, did things as it pertains to EEO. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, is learn your organization, right? You can't just be focused on what you do, but learn what your organization does as a whole, right? And then see how you fit in the broader picture. I think having that perspective, um, I know for me, helps me uh, see that, you know, I'm just the, I'm part of the bigger piece, right, the, the larger puzzle. What I do matters, right? And it also enabled me to see how I could help um, the organization from my position accomplish its, its mission and its goal. Um, the last thing I'll leave you with, I hear a lot of times we say diversity is our strength, right? Um, and I think that's true. We all bring something individually to the table, right? And we need to embrace that and make impacts where we can. And I think as we move on today and we hear other folks' stories, we have so many trailblazers on the call today that have made their mark and showed that Having a woman at the table, having somebody who looked different in the room um, made the organization better. And I will turn it over, I think, to Ruth Hader, who is the um, Regional Contracting Chief for the Northwestern Division. Thank you, Nicole. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's really an honor to be able to talk to you today and tell you my story in my career, and, and I would like to uh, thank Beth and Jenny for putting this together a second time, which is really cool, and to see so many people um, participating. And so Beth started out telling us that, um, you know, maybe what we could do is, is give some advice to young female employees um, entering the workforce to um, talk about things we've learned from our career that we then use to develop our staff, to talk about um, something that we're most proud of that we've done during our career and why? And then how do we see ourselves in the bigger collective picture? So for me, my career started um, as a soldier and uh, I'm very proud of that and, and served my country for uh, a whole career in the Army before I transitioned to be a federal civil servant. And when I think about what I would tell young women today as they're entering the workforce, I had three pillars of strength, I call them, uh, that guided me through my whole career. And they are tenacity, adaptability, embracing change, and professionalism. And so as I speak of my career, you'll see where these are going to show up throughout this story. Um, I started as a young private in the Army. I was a military police officer at Fort Benning, Georgia 
one of very few women um, who were in the organization at the time. And I can remember being told that I needed to stay in the patrol car while they went to arrest someone because that's not what women do. Um, from during that time, I uh, took, if you can believe it, um, 10 years and seven colleges to get a bachelor's degree. But that's that tenacity pillar that I talked about. Just never give up on getting a degree. And once I got that degree, I then went to my first assignment as a young lieutenant. And I went to the 937th Engineer Group in Fort Riley, Kansas, and walked in the door as a logistics officer. So I'm not an engineer. Uh, I got a degree in, in business and communications. And so I walk in the door and they send me to the logistics part of the headquarters and they tell me, go get a passport, you're going to Honduras. And so I get a passport and I fly to Honduras and I'm with an engineer battalion from Fort Bragg, North Carolina. They don't know what to do with me. So they sent me to the contracting office at this air base in Honduras. And that's where I first bought pea gravel and board feet of lumber to support their missions in building hospitals and clinics and schools and runways um, in that country. And I just fell in love with construction contracting. And I will tell you, I chased it for the rest of my career. Um, fast forward to 9-11 and I found myself as a, uh, an officer at Fort um, Bragg, North Carolina, uh, one of the um, many of the units there, you know, quickly deployed um, into Afghanistan, and my unit was one of those. And so I found myself leaving my two and a half year old daughter um, for a six month deployment to Afghanistan as the chief of contracting um, in support, you know, of our mission there, and left her at home with her dad and a nanny. Uh, and went across, you know, the world. Um, that was a very difficult thing to do, but but it it was part of that tenacity. It was I knew I could do it. I would I would tell you um, if you're if you're looking to have a partner in your life, I would encourage you that your partner um, care about your career and your goals as much as they care about their own, because that's what I have is somebody that cares, and it helped me be able to deploy on a moment's notice almost and know that they were all gonna be fine. Um, adaptability, while deployed to Afghanistan, uh, my boss, a man, uh, said, you're going on a mission tonight, get ready. And I'm like, what do you mean? And he said, you're going with a special operations A team. They need you to go and uh, procure some vehicles for them. And so I jumped on a, a very strange looking aircraft in the middle of the night and uh, flew into a mixed uh, airfield in the middle of the desert. And the next day we went into a small Afghan town and we sat um, with the elders of that community and we drank tea and I negotiated to get that team a set of uh, Toyota pickup trucks and lease them for them to do their mission. Um, you, you, have, you know, I was scared to death but I needed to be adaptable and do what the mission called for. Um, so fast forward again, and I finished my military career, and I find myself as a civilian looking for work, and I applied, I kid you not, I applied to the Honolulu District as to a GS-12 position contract specialist, and I couldn't even make the referral list. They said I wasn't qualified. Um, so that was a hard thing to take after a career of being a contracting chief um, within the military. And, and so fast forward and I saw the job in Walla Walla open up as the chief of contracting and I applied. And I will tell you that um, being in the right place at the right time is something that's very important to your career. And that's what happened to me there. And I was selected as the chief of contracting and served for 10 years in the Walla Walla district before, excuse me, before I got um, selected for this new position that I now hold. And in, in that position, again, being adaptable, I would tell you seek opportunities to develop yourself outside of your career field. Professionalism means knowing your, your trade craft, be an expert in your trade craft, but also know when it's time to broaden yourself. Like Nicole said, learn your organization. And I was given the opportunity to serve as the deputy chief of operations for six months in the Walla Walla district. And I learned an awful lot about how we operate 
um, the navigation systems and the hydropower facilities within our district to understand the core better. Um, professionalism, what does that mean besides learning your trade craft? I would tell you that you need to be able to be physically, mentally, and spiritually strong. And in doing so, you are preparing yourselves to take on just about anything. Um, the most important thing or the most thing I'm most proud of, again, ties back to those three pillars, is in 2018, I took six weeks off from work. I walked away from the office. I left all the people I had trained in charge, and I walked 500 miles across northern Spain on the Camino de Santiago, a pilgrimage. And I unplugged. I, I left my family home. I left my work here. And it was a very um, great event to be able to help people be confident in themselves, that they were in charge, leave my partner in charge at home, and, and to do some physical, mental, and spiritual growth of, of, for myself. So never give up an opportunity to help yourself as well. Um, with that, I will turn it over to Sheila. And she is Sheila Newman, and she is the Chief of Operations in Omaha District. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you guys today. I, um, I am the Chief of Operations in Omaha now, but I started out um, in 1988, right out of high school, 17 years old, enlisted in the United States Air Force, and served a tour as a bomb navigation system specialist on B-52s. And um, there were 35 men, and there was me, and if you know anything about B-52s, there's a lot of small places in there. And if you've met me in person, you know I'm not big, so those guys were so happy to see me. I did every job that required people to fold themselves into a tiny little box with wrenches and screwdrivers. And honestly, I, um, I enjoyed every bit of it. Uh, the master sergeant who took me under his wing for those formative years was wonderful, treated me like family, and I carry him in my heart all these years later. Um, I went from active duty to working in healthcare for nearly a decade, which is a wonderful field when you have an active duty spouse. So my husband was um, active duty up until 2015, so I did a lot of different healthcare jobs, everything from psychiatric hospitals to working uh, for trios of doctors in Las Vegas, depending on where his assignments were. And then when I was about 30, I had the opportunity to go to college, and I used my GI Bill to do that. Um, and then very thankfully, uh, there was a program at the time called Spouses Tuition Assistance, which um, through my husband and the Air Force paid for 75% of my graduate school. And sometime during that, um, those years, I had a professor who said, let me introduce you to this guy I know who works for the Army. And I started with the core as a clerk, I believe it was a GS-0301 clerk, and worked my way up over uh, multiple years in different jobs to a GS-12, and then went right back to being a housewife because my husband had gotten reassigned to New Mexico and the Corps didn't have a job for me. But um, uh, the Air Force did at a lower grade, so I worked for the Air Force as a customer of the Corps of Engineers uh, for a couple of years. And I think that that was pretty invaluable experience to see us from the, uh, the other side, if you will. Uh, when my husband retired, I went right back to the Corps of Engineers for the Huntington District, opening up a field office for them in Ohio. And they later built an office for me at Dillon Dam, which was my first, um, my first opportunity to really experience operations. And I worked as the Appalachia Coal Program Manager for Huntington, Buffalo, and Pittsburgh for several years under the LEAD District Initiative. And then went to Alaska as a Special Actions Branch Chief, dealing with yucky mucky EISs and lots of difficult issues. That position evolved into a regional deputy position over Alaska and Hawaii. And during that time, I got a call from the chairwoman of the CEQ under the Trump administration to come work for the White House for six months on the rewrite of the NEPA regulations. If you'd asked me, um, at 17 years old out of Northeast Philadelphia, if I'd ever find myself working for the White House, I would have just laughed and probably walked away. But all of that happened, and then this remarkable opportunity came to be the Chief of Operations in Omaha. And I'll tell you what, I, I, um, 
sometimes I'm just fascinated that I get to be so privileged to work with such a great group and just love what I do. So, so that work experience would tell you, you know, I've done a lot of different things for a lot of different people, civilian, different agencies. I will tell you that I, I have loved none better than the Corps, and the reason is I think the Corps of Engineers takes better care of their people than anyone else I have ever worked for. If I had to give advice to young women or young men after all of these years, so some 30-some years later, I'd say, first of all, be honest with yourself and be true to yourself. No one knows what is right for you better than you. And for me, when it was right for me to be a stay-at-home mom, I was a stay-at-home mom. And when it was right for me to go to college, I went to college. And there is no do it this way and you will get to that next spot. If it's not right for you, don't do it. I'd also say, this is one thing I preach in our agency strongly, people are a culmination of their experience not just what you see them doing in their present position. When you look at me, you probably don't envision a person who's got a tool belt on and is working on a flight line 12 hours a day, turning wrenches to keep bombers in the air. And I remind all of our folks that if you don't get to know who it is that works for you, you'll never know what their full potential is because you can be so many different things in your life and you just don't know where it's going to take you. Um, particularly for ladies, I would say don't be afraid to ask questions and share your ideas. You know, the only thing that is a danger is what's left undone because we didn't have the opportunity or the courage to share it with others. And then I guess the last thing I would leave folks with is just be kind. I don't care what you do in life, just be kind. And I guess with that, it is my privilege to introduce Jen Richman, who is our division counsel. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Sheila. And I'll, I'll echo sort of uh, your advice as well to do what is right for you and to be yourself. To me, that has always been important throughout my career. Um, I grew up in the 1970s and 80s in Northern California, and I came home from um, school one day in the fourth grade and I told my parents that I was going to be an archaeologist when I grew up. And my parents told me that I could be absolutely anything that I wanted to be, which was a bit of a deviation from both of their paths. But for my mom, when she was growing up, she was told that she could either just be a teacher or a nurse. And she was a nurse. So I followed my dream and I spent 10 years as an archaeologist before switching gears into, into law. Um, my law school currently has about half of their, um, their uh, student body is identified as female, but I was thinking about it, and I think I only had one professor, maybe two out of about 25 during my time there that was a woman. And the percentage of practicing attorneys in the United States is still only about 37%. The core, however, is about half. And, and like you've already heard, it's just a great place to work with a lot of support. Um, I, I think that these statistics have improved over my short career, and there's still a ways to go. Um, I started with the Corps in 2002 at Northwestern Division. Uh, I was hired by Becky Ransom, who then proceeded to retire like three months later. Um, which was disappointing because she was phenomenal and an incredible mentor and um, one of the first women and the only woman with the core that I've ever worked for. So it was a very short period of time, but still um, very uh, defining of my own career. I, I was hired in part to, to do cultural resources law. And that was my dream, to do archaeology and the law together. I never thought that I would stay with the Corps for very long, or um, certainly not to become a supervisory attorney at any point. I, I would joke around a lot that I, the reason I became an archaeologist is that I like dead people and not really alive people. Um, but that changed. I moved to Portland District in 2011. And I loved building an office, supporting my office, supporting the division as a whole. 
And I decided that, yeah, I actually think I could be pretty good at being a supervisor, so I shifted gears. One of the problems, though, that I've several times over my career, um, with some regularity, I've been asked whether I think that I'm in the position I am today because I'm single and I don't have children. That is not something that I think a man has ever been asked, and no, that's not why I think I'm in this position. Um, I spent some time over the last few months meeting with each of the 60 or so attorneys working within Northwestern Division, and every single one has been facing challenges over this past year, as we all have. Um, but I did notice that multiple of the female attorneys mentioned how they really liked all the virtual training, virtual conferences, and virtual developmental assignments because they could take those opportunities rather than needing to make decisions between their family and their career. I'm sure that some of the men also have felt that way, but none of them mentioned that to me. Um, I found the Corps overall to be very, very supportive as a, both a woman and as an attorney. And um, so I wanted to end because the celebration of the Women's uh, History Month cannot be done without quoting the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg. So in the words of the notorious RBG, I'm sometimes asked whether there will be, when there will be enough women on the Supreme Court, and I say when there are nine, and people are shocked. But there have been nine men, and no one's ever raised the question about that. So now I'd like to turn it, the mic over to Amy Reese, who's the uh, Seattle District Chief of Operations. Thanks, Jen, and thanks for quoting RGD. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Amy Reese. Uh, Seattle District Operations Division Chief, and um, I'm going to go through a little bit of my history and then also try to reflect on the questions of our role in collective history and also um, some of the mentors that I've had in my career. Um, so I was born in 1972, which was the year of Title IX, which is the federal civil rights law that was passed. Um, that helps uh, equal, equality of funding for females uh, and sex-based discrimination in any school or other education program. And I reflect on that because uh, as Jenny went through her history, um, I'm less, less than a decade behind her in my career, um, but I, I find that a lot of her anecdotes are different, uh, re remarkably different than mine. So I went to the University of Washington, so we're both from the Pacific Northwest, and in my civil engineering program, I would say we were about 40% female. My graduation uh, in my grad program, so I, I worked in the pink room uh, for a professor at the, at the UW, and we were, all but one of us were female. Um, and when I was hired into uh, the Corps of Engineers, uh, one of my main person that I worked with uh, in water management, I was hired by uh, Marion Valentine, so I was hired by a, a team of three people, one of which was a woman, and then had Carolyn Fitzgerald that I worked with really closely throughout my early career. So in a matter of that 10 years, I think a, a very different, um, uh, I had a very different experience than, than the women that came before me. Um, so um, one, and, and then um, one of the things I also remember early on, let's see, um, we, I remember back to one of the first kickoff meetings for the Columbia River Treaty work. So this was long before 2018 was, it was back when 2018 seemed like a long way off. And it was a kickoff meeting for CRT. And one of the, um, one of the uh, icebreakers we did is we split up into district pods. And so I remember our, we had economists and PM and water management and tech, you know, hy hydraulic engineers. And, and I remember looking out at all the different districts. In Seattle, we were almost all women, and all the other districts were almost all men. So I, I feel like um, I've been blessed to work in Seattle District because, uh, you know, we had uh, leaders like Wayne Wagner and Ron Bush and others that did a lot of mentoring and hiring and working with women and, and bringing up through the ranks. Um, I... Uh, so let's see. So another thing, a piece of collective history I, I feel like we have in, in Seattle is we have a daycare on site. 
And for all the parents in the district who've used the daycare, I think we all can kind of relate back to, to the establishment of the daycare and how it's helped us be able to stay and be and the retention that Seattle District has been able to have with a lot of its employees because they've provided that service. Um, so that's been very helpful to me in my career. So uh, it was hiring the right people and then putting uh, procedures in place and, and an environment in place that can retain and keep those people and train them. Uh, and then eventually now I'm on a corporate board in Seattle District um, with, with uh, you know, the DPM is a woman, the chief of engineering is a woman, Siri Nelson was uh, the chief of uh, council before she retired. Um, so uh, I think I've been able to witness, you know, what it takes to build a strong, uh, diverse program uh, through time. So um, my, my history in my career, so I came in uh, as a hydraulic engineer, uh, worked in water management, was the senior water manager for the Columbia Basin, moved on to the chief of water management. Um, during a um, maternity leave for Carolyn Fitzgerald, I got to serve as the, um, for six months of detail, in the chief of hydraulic engineering, which I think is notable because, um, one, Carolyn was allowed to take a, a long, uh, what at that time was a quite a long maternity leave, but that gave me the opportunity to have a developmental assignment that really helped build my skills and helped build my career. So it was, a, it was for the organization, it was a double benefit that allowed, um, somebody to have time home with their child while a uh, developmental opportunity for somebody else. So I think those kind of policies have really helped with retren retention and training and um, keeping the right folks on, on board. Um, so yeah, I, I, I see Siri Nelson's name in there. She was certainly a mentor to me. Uh, I, I got to come over from, after being a branch chief in hydraulic engineering, I really liked to, to be able to work at the branch <laughs> chief level. So when Wayne Wagner retired, um, the person who uh, hired me in, into the Corps in the first place, um, I was selected by Ms. Coffey to replace um, Wayne Wagner as the Deputy for Operations Division. So certainly uh, really learned a lot and enjoyed my time working for Ms. Coffey as the Deputy in Operations Division. Um, and then uh, now I've been selected as the Operations Division Chief and I've been there since 2014. Uh, but since 2016. Um, so um, one of the things I'm most proud of uh, in my career, uh, I would say, and, and as far as the collective history piece and what we've seen as we've grown together through this organization is, uh, you know, I, I think COVID and how we're working uh, in COVID and taking care of people and the flexibility we've seen in the workforce one, I'm really proud at how we've adapted and how we've still been able to move along and meet our mission, but um, adapt in ways we never saw before with COVID. And two, I think we're seeing another big wave in our collective history and how we as a workforce can be flexible for our employees. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see where we go from here. Um, and the next person I'm gonna introduce is um, a. Uh, Joanne Walls, who's our Chief of Engineering uh, in Seattle District. Hello. Yeah, so this is Joanne Walls. I'm Chief of Engineering here at the Seattle District, um, at least the rest of this week. Next week, I'm going to start on a 120-day temporary uh, filling for the uh, ENC Chief at Division. So I will be, I'll still be sitting right here, but <laughs> taking on a new role for 120 days while they backfill that position permanently. So um, I have uh, worked for the court. Well, let's see, I, I graduated from Gonzaga University, go Zags, um, in uh, 1982 with a degree in uh, civil engineering and in um, business. I was recruited by the Corps of Engineers uh, in the Alaska District. And so I began my career up in the Alaska District. Um, like Ginny, I was on the, what we called the back then the EIT program, um, engineering training. It's now the DA intern. Actually, I think it's called the Apprentice Program now. Something like that. They keep changing the name. But um, so, yeah, I started um, working for them. Um, and then once I finished my rotation, I worked as a structural engineer uh, up in the Alaska district. I then, when uh, my daughter was born in 1988, 
And at that point, I um, was debating as far as whether I would continue to work. I, I felt like I, I wanted to be able to have more time with my, with my child. Um, my husband worked for the Corps also, so um, I felt like it would work for me to stay home. My boss talked to me about maybe working part-time, which was, I didn't even know that was an option. And so uh, I was able to continue after I took some uh, time off uh, when, with the birth of my child to come back and work part-time for the Corps. I was a permanent employee, it wasn't a temporary thing, but uh, in a part-time status. And so that was a real uh, benefit for me to be able to do that. Um, I did continue, though, to work part-time for 15 years. I you know I had people um, during my, those 15 years asking me when I was gonna come back to work uh, full-time because my kids were getting older, they were in school, but I just really, I enjoyed that balance. For me, it was, a, it was a great balance to be able to have extra time with my kids, to be able to participate more in their school activities, and to be able to continue to work for the Corps. And so I did that for 15 years, um, working as a structural engineer. Um, I, I did at one point um, come back to the, come down to the Seattle district and spent about three years there. When I returned to Alaska, because I did want to continue to work part-time, I ended up moving to the uh, HTRW, Hazardous Toxic um, Radioactive Waste Program, like Ginny, the cleanup program up in the Alaska district. And um, so I worked in that for, for many years. Um, I finally, um, when my kids were um, going into high school, uh, decided to, to look at working permanently. They had a supervisor position open up in the, the environmental group, and so I ended up applying and was selected um, for a supervisor position. So then I began my, my full-time career. Um, and I think it was at that point that I kind of, you know, I, I'd always enjoyed working for the Corps. I really loved my work, but I hadn't really focused on my career as much as I was just, you know, I was enjoying what I was doing, but I was enjoying the part-time um, that, was, that was allowed. But working as a supervisor, I found that I really enjoyed doing that. I really liked being a supervisor, um, loved working with, with people more. Um, and so that, that was great. Um, I then had opportunities for, uh, to do several developmental assignments. I'd spent a few years as a supervisor and was ready to try something new. And that's just something that I would encourage you. If you've been in a job for a while and you feel like, you know, you wanna try something, look for, for opportunities for developmental assignments. I spent um, some time as the quality uh, manager, um, the QMS um, manager, I spent some time as a deputy for engineering, some time as uh, working in PM. So it gave me an opportunity to just kind of work in some different areas and kind of try some different things out. Then I, uh, at that point, um, was ready to, my kids were off to college and so there wasn't any ties to Alaska anymore. And so I uh, looked for and um, was selected for a branch chief position at the Seattle district and then uh, in, uh, see, that was in 2011, and then at the end of 2013, I was selected for the division chief position um, for engineering. So that's kind of the, the full uh, thing of my career. Um, I think, you know, um, I would say my career was uh, slow in going at the beginning because of working part-time. I worked as a GS 11 and 12 for, for quite a few number of years, but, um, you know, I think taking advantage of those developmental opportunities kind of broadened my horizons, um, and so um, then was able to compete successfully for uh, moving up in the, in the organization. I never thought back when I was working part-time that I would become a, the chief of engineering. I didn't really even have that on my radar, so, um, but I'm loving, loving doing this job now. Um, but I would say, you know, I would just encourage folks to, to, you know, like I said, look for developmental opportunities for, for people with families, you know, look at, there is, there is possibilities of doing part-time work and it can be really beneficial if that's kind of what you need for your balance. So, you know, talk to supervisors about it, look for opportunities to maybe do that as well. Um, and I think, I think that was all I had. Um, Thank you for you guys participating. It's great to talk to you. Oh, one thing, I guess one thing just to add, just back to when I first started my career, Jenny mentioned, you know, three computers to share and carbon copies. When I started, we didn't even have computers, so that's how far back that was. So, <laughs> anyway, thank you. And I think next we're going to hear from Liza Wells, who's our Chief of Engineering and Construction at the Portland District. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. 
I'm going to answer Beth's question. What advice would you give a young female employee entering the workforce knowing what you know today? And I think my advice to our young employees, whether female or male, would be to, to be your own advocate. You've heard some others talk about how you're really the one who knows the best what would be right for you. So if you have something you're passionate about, talk about it and, and find a way to make it happen. Um, I think this is important so that you can feel motivated and effective in your job. And so thinking about Women's History Month, I'll tell you how I, how I thought about this advice and how it's helped me um, as I've moved through my career. I was looking way back into my history and I realized that I became an advocate for myself all the way back in high school. Uh, right before my senior year of high school, I moved to a new school. And, uh, you know, though that, that really stunk, um, I, was, I was really excited to continue to play golf on the golf team. And so I got to my new school and the golf coach, I met him and he said, oh, well, there, there's no women's golf team. And uh, I mean, he just said, there's no women's team. And I said, well, there's a men's team, isn't there? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I'll play on that. And he kind of looked at me and it got to, yeah. <laughs> so I got to play on the team. And so that was the start of it. Uh, when I was in college at MIT, I realized I loved hydraulic engineering. And I did really well in my fluids class and had to have a job to, to earn money through college. So I came up with a proposal for my professor and convinced him to let me be his teaching assistant for a couple years. So that, that was really a great experience for me that I wouldn't have had otherwise. After college, I worked for about 13 years in the private sector as a hydraulic engineer. Um, I had two kids, and like some of the others you've heard, I advocated for working part-time. But I also really advocated for staying involved in some really challenging projects along the way. At one point, I advocated for how I could help put together a really big contract proposal that my company was working on to do work for the Portland district. And I, I worked really hard on it. I worked on it through um, a little bit of it through my maternity leave because I was able to do it um, part time. It turned out we won that contract and I ended up being able to serve as a project manager on um, several task orders and built a relationship with, with the Portland district folks. I also advocated for starting and leading a Portland office to better serve our clients, including the Portland district. And this was something that was really good for my company, but it was also a really good move personally for, for me and my family at the time. In 2009, I realized I needed a change from the private sector and I advocated with the people I got to know it at the Corps of Engineers to work here and be closer to uh, our public service mission. And I joined the hydraulic design section. Over time, I thought I could be effective as a section chief and a supervisor, and then um, as the H&H &H branch chief, and now as the engineering and construction division chief. Um, you know, I think about the things I've advocated for along the way to help us do our work better. Um, things like our leadership development program to help build new leaders, um, looking into to advocating things for our projects. And somewhere along the way, I've really shifted that advocacy from um, thinking about what's best for me to really building up my staff and our organization. So those, the people on the panel know that I'm, I've got a little history moment here for you. I'm pretty proud of my high school version of me for being her own advocate way back then and helping me get where I'm able to serve today. So I'm going to read you a little ex excerpt from this history book called My Senior Yearbook. Okay, it says, students could see that times had changed as stereotypes were broken and precedents were made. On the green, senior Liza Wells shattered the image of a male-dominated sport as a member of the golf team. So that's how I got started. <laughs> Looking back, I realized that all those small things I've advocated for have really motivated me and helped me be the most effective I can for my organization. So my advice to you is to be your own advocate and chart your own path. I'll turn things over to Judy Hutchins. 
She's our Executive Officer for Northwestern Division. Thank you. Thanks, Liza. Great story. Love the senior yearbook or the yearbook. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Judy Hutchings, Executive Officer at Northwestern Division. Um, I have sort of a maybe a different career path that I'll share with you, but I'll start from the end in answering Beth's question about what, what piece of advice uh, I would give to anyone um, in building their careers. Mine is simple. Take a leap of faith. Do it. Take a leap of faith. Maybe hard along the way and sacrifices along the way, but take a leap of faith. And so with that, I'll give you a little bit of my background and, and sort of some insight to the leaps of faith that I took uh, that led me down my career path um, and find myself here today. Um, my story starts of my childhood. I was born and raised on a little tiny island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with a population of roughly 5,000, um, okay, decades ago, but it hasn't grown much since. Uh, so I, I led quite the sheltered life. Um, my dad was an immigrant from the Philippines who touted and reinforced with us every single day the importance of education. Got to go to, got to go to college. So. Every one of his kids graduated from college. It took me a little bit longer than most of my siblings, but I did uh, finish. Um, my first leap of faith was going to college. Um, I graduated from high school. I'm not going to tell you when because it was a long time ago. <laughs> um, but so I grew up in Hawaii, and, and at the time, you know, the University of Hawaii was, was uh, gaining some momentum in, in the college world. Uh, I didn't even bother to apply there. I said, I, I am out of here. I'm leaving. That was my first leap of faith. I'm going somewhere uncharted waters, for me at least, um, because if I stayed here, I would stay here forever. So I left, and I went and landed in Mankato, Minnesota, don't ask me how, but that's where I ended up, uh, in the middle of the Midwest, um, late summer, so it was still warm. Um, I knew no one, not a single soul. I had a big box full of, of my belongings, um, a suitcase full of clothes, and, and I landed on Mankato, Minnesota to start uh, school. Two years later, after hating the winters, um, I decided I'm leaving Minnesota because I can't, uh, oh, it was just not for me, not my cup of tea. Um, so I packed my bags and took my second leap of faith and moved to Denver, Colorado. Uh, loved it there, flourished there. Uh, I didn't finish school there though, um, but I did love it there. Met my husband. Uh, he was active duty Air Force at the time. Uh, we got married and moved to Germany. So that was my next leap of faith. Uh, you know, historically, our family had nothing to do with the military. I had never lived halfway across the world or on the opposite side of the world, um, but I went. Um, in my travels overseas was when I started my career with the Corps. I started as a GS for secretary, and I do have to say along the way, so my previous uh, employment history leading up to starting with the Corps was in banking. Uh, had never a desire to work federal service, but being um, part of the military community as a military spouse, um, traveling the world was a, a challenge. It was fun and exciting, but it was a challenge for career building, right? Um, some of you may have uh, military parents uh, whose spouses had to sacrifice their careers um, because we could never stay in one location long enough. Uh, that was my experience. So I left banking, we traveled, traveled a lot, lived overseas for a total of 16 years. Um, but during that time is when I landed my, my first job with the Corps as a GS4 secretary. 
And I do have to say, you know, having been with the Corps now for over 20 years, um, that in the secretarial field back then, and even 20 years later now, um, women have a tendency to feel sort of pigeonholed into that line of work. Um, there are males in that field, um, maybe few and far between, um, but they do equally as good a job. Um, anyway, so that was the start of my career and what I consider another leap of faith because I could not spell Corps of Engineers at the time. Uh, I had no idea who they were, what they did, uh, what they were about, but that was my job. And I stuck with it. Um, fast forward 10 years later from starting that position, uh, our parents were getting older and it was time to move back to the continental US when I took my next leap of faith with a job uh, at Portland District that brought me to Portland. Uh, I had no idea what Portland was about. Uh, trees, I think, was all I knew about Portland. Uh, we still have them, um, but I knew not a single soul in Portland. Uh, and at the time, my husband did not have a job to return to because he still worked in the military community. And as you know, we don't have such a military community here in Portland. Um, but again, I took a leap of faith. I said, it's, it's time now for me to, to take the opportunities presented to me and build a career with the Corps. I left my husband in Germany and I moved to Portland, Oregon. So that was a huge leap of faith. Um, and that was probably one of the hardest leaps. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to find my notes. I, I guess, sorry, I'm trying to look at my notes. Those are, in a nutshell, my leaps of faith. Um, trust in your gut and what you feel will work for you in your careers. Um, you know, in, in my position as the executive officer at NWD, my predecessor was a physical scientist. My current colleagues have various educational backgrounds um, in music, in history, uh, like I said, Pam, my, my predecessor, was a physical scientist. Uh, there are program managers in, in my position at other embassies. Um, we have, you know, quite the varied background. And, and I know this audience of over 200 uh, has a varied background. So take a leap of faith. Seek out what you feel will work for you in your lives. Um, open your aperture to what opportunities are out there for you. You know, there, there's something that I know a lot of the Portland District LDP graduates will understand when I say there's more than one right answer, right? There, there's opportunities galore. Take a leap of faith and, and trust your gut and go with it. That's my advice for today. Thanks for listening to my story, a uh, long roundabout way, but Happy to be here. The core is an awesome place to work. I've loved it for 20 some years now. In any case, I will turn it over to Mona Thomason, who is celebrating and getting ready to retire after some 40 years of service. Mona. Thank you, Judy, and everybody for having me here. I, I do have to say, I got my first federal job 40 years ago, but I actually only officially have 36 years of service. I'll start by telling you my history, and you'll be able to figure out exactly how old I am when I tell you that I got my first federal job in 1981 as a junior in high school when I was a congressional page for Congress in Washington, D.C., um, which was a full-time job while I went to high school full-time. Um, super, super exciting, super fun. Um, I think, you know, says something about me and my motivation that I was able to get that um, kind of thing. Um, anyway, my, my core history started in 1985 when I was hired on as an economics assistant in the then economics and 
an al economics analysis section in Portland District. Um, I spent 25, 26 of my 36 years of service in um, NWD starting in, in Portland District. Um, did that for two years, graduated, hired full time in a ladder position there in Portland. As a GS 11, um, a former colleague recruited me, asked me if I would move to Mobile District to be the lead economist on an enormous project that they were just starting right there in Portland District at the time, 36 years ago. Um, there were 10 or so people in economics. You don't see economic sections like that anymore. Um, and I was obviously, as a, you know, 24 year old or whatever I was, I'm super junior and I had the very small project. So I took a lateral to um, Mobile District without even promotion potential um, to, to be the lead economist on this really exciting um, new project. I did one of the first Monte Carlo simulations um, using the Cray computer at Erdic, running around the building. Um, at all hours, you know, loading up the simulation at the end of the day. Anyway, so that was a, that was a great job. I did four years in um, in Mobile District. Um, my my then husband was unable to find a um, job that he found really fulfilling. So when we were in Mobile, he actually joined the Coast Guard, um, and his first assignment was in Los Angeles. And so. Um, we moved to Los Angeles for his job, and I was able to um, get a transfer, another lateral um, to Los Angeles district. And while I was there, I got my first supervisory job as a chief of an economic section. Um, four years later, he was transferred to um, the headquarters in Washington, D.C. So I followed him to Washington, D.C. for another lateral um, transfer. I was, I was with, um, did I say, Institute for Water Resources in Washington, D.C., a policy and planning think tank. Um, after just two and a half years there, um, he decided to get out of the service and we decided to move back to the West Coast where we were both from. So I started looking for jobs. We both started looking for jobs on the West Coast. Um, I was selected for and moved to Seattle District, like many people on this on this panel, and I did um, 10 years in Seattle District as the Chief of Planning Branch in Seattle District. Divorced, remarried in 2010, um, applied for and got a lateral transfer as the Chief of Product Coordination Branch in the Hydroelectric Design Center at Portland District. So moved um, to to live in the same city as my husband, um, in, as my new husband in, in 2010. Um, spent five years there, and then it was six years ago that I moved to the headquarters NWD as the chief of business management um, division. So that's my that's my career story. Um, I'm, somebody said, I'm too young to retire. I'm actually going to be retiring two weeks after my minimum retirement age. So I'm, uh, I am I am just barely old enough to retire. Um, so the things I wanted to tell everybody, you know, some of them aren't necessarily for, for new employees. Um, one of them, obviously, you know, I was benefited by mobility. Um, and I got a lot of great experience across the entire country. I know people, everybody can't do that, um, but, you know, others have said, do what you can to be mobile, have diverse experience, um, you know, how, however you can. Um, but even if you can't move around, you need to be open to um, opportunities, and, and, and opportunities um, maybe outside of your day-to-day -day business um, to start showing some leadership, um, show different skills than maybe you're able to do in your day-to-day -day job. And one thing that I was reminded that I have not thought about this in years, when I was in Mobile District as a um, young economist, I was the um, EEO um, Special Emphasis Program Manager for the Women's Program. And so um, it was my other duty as a sign to um, put together these types of sessions during Women's History Month um, when I was in Mobile District. Um, anyway, and so that's the kind of thing that obviously brings you to the attention of 
you know, people who can who can see what your capabilities are. Um, so be open, be open to opportunities. Um, um, don't discount or beat yourself up um, on account of luck. Some some of my moves were just super lucky. I was in the right place at the right time. Got to be open to those opportunities. Um, Got to have the confidence to call the economic section chief in LA district and say, hey, I'm moving to LA. Any chance you have work for me? And, you know, he says, oh, you know what? Um, we actually totally have way too many people who do flood damage reduction um, economics. I really need somebody who's a specialist in hurricane and storm damage reduction and navigation. And I said, oh, that's all I've done. I think I've done one net one storm dam or one um, flood damage study in my entire career. Um, anyway, and so I was lucky I had the experience um, that he was looking for, and I was, you know, so he was willing to hire hire me. So there is there is that piece of luck. Um, so don't don't discount that. Um, the another thing I wanted to tell you is that. Um, Educate yourself, obviously, and a lot of us have, you know, this love of learning as, as being something that draws us to the core. Um, and there's a couple places where I'd like you, like to encourage people, if you haven't done this, to do this. Um, and, and the first one is something that I think is more applicable to people later in their career. But that is learn how the money works in the core of engineers. Learn how districts are funded. Follow the money. There are just so many, yes, they, yes, Kelly, I know, I know. As an economist and doing, you know, economic analyses of benefits, obviously that's, you know, one of my deals. Um, but as you move up in the organization, um, gosh, I don't know if most people realize it, but the branch chiefs run the business of the district, and it is a business. You've got income, you've got expenses, you've got to balance them. You have to understand how that all works um, in order to make the best decisions and to do what's, what's right. So, so follow the money, learn how the money works in the Corps of Engineers if you don't know that yet. The other thing I want to encourage people to do um, is to educate yourself if you haven't yet, and I think, you know, this is something that's changed over time, on what it means to be working as a woman. Um, I was very lucky. I started, you know, from, from the time I was, you know, knee high. Um, I had parents who were telling me I could be whatever I wanted when I grew up. I could, I remember, I could be the president of the United States if I wanted to. You know, you could be the first woman's, women's president. And so I was always, you know, encouraged to go to go to college, be a professional, um, super, super encouraging um, supervisors. I rarely felt um, held back um, because I was female. Um, but what I wanted to say is that I moved to one particular district and was super surprised to find out, oh, actually, there's stuff that is going on to women in general. Um, anyway, and so um, I started educating myself on unconscious bias. Um, what does that mean? And I think if you understand unconscious bias, we all do it, we all have it. Um, and, you know, in, in today when we're starting to focus on um, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, learning about unconscious bias and what it means and how it affects how we make decisions and how we treat people is super important. And I think that if you understand better why you feel the way you do and if you learn how women tend to operate versus how men tend to operate. You know, there's scientific studies out there. It's, you know, it's true that, you know, people treat us differently. We think differently. All, all of that's true. Um, anyway, but if you can, if you can understand that, maybe it'll help give you the confidence to, and the confidence and um, to be able to see, oh, you know what? I said something and nobody listened, 
And I said it again, and nobody listened. And then this guy heard it, heard me say it, and he said it, and everybody jumped all over it. I need to realize that's happening and do a better job of advocating for myself. Oh, men have way more confidence than women, and they'll, you know, strut around and pretend to be an expert, whereas women with, you know, 10 times as much experience are often, you know, self-effacing and don't want to take credit for it. You learn, nope, you know what, I can get out there, I can do it. So that's, so that's part of the educating yourself on, on the unconscious bias, how you look at yourself, how others look at you, and how it can help you in the workplace. Um, the la let me see. I think the last thing I wanted to say, which every, a ton of people said, um, you say this is a great place to work. Sorry, I think I hit the keyboard with my um, book I have on my lap. Anyway, um, so I was just I was just finishing up with the uh, what a great place to work the Corps of Engineers is. Um, I've done a you know 36 year career in the Corps of Engineers and loved it. Um, with very very rare exceptions, and none for my supervisors have always had great um, supportive supervisors, um, colleagues, peers, senior leaders. Um, really, just a great place. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, next up after me is Kate Furlong Board. Kate is NWD's uh, senior human resources advisor. Kate, on to you. Thanks, Mona. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I had the benefit of attending the, the first session last week and listening to everyone's stories. And <clears throat> I guess to me it's very inspiring because when I think about my own very short story, uh, it, it does demonstrate that we are progressing. We have a lot of work to do still. Um, yesterday I was asked to run a report, and it, it was uh, largely about how many women were uh, in our blue-collar workforce, and I was, you know, shocked to see, I don't know why, but I was shocked to see that there was only 43 out of, you know, 883 blue-collar workers uh, within Northwestern Division. So I, I am certainly aware there's a lot of work to do, but I think that there has been uh, progress. So. I'll just kind of share my short story. Uh, I uh, grew up in Leavenworth, Washington. Yes, a little Bavaria. Uh, very sheltered, right? So maybe similar to Judy, very sheltered. Uh, decided I was going to get out of Dodge. Uh, went to school in um, Southern California. Who doesn't want to hit the beaches? Um, and uh, coming from two civil servant parents, they were like, you have got to get into civil service. And I was like, no, 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 not going to do it. Uh, but an opportunity, of course, presented itself uh, after 9-11. Um, Camp Pendleton was hiring um, a lot of security assistants. So I started as a temporary student, GS2, in security. Uh, it was sat down at a on my first day in front of a typewriter. Um, and I looked left and right and didn't do anything. And the office, uh, who happened to be all male, asked me why I wasn't getting started. I told them, well, first you're gonna have to tell me how to turn it on, uh, you know, and secondly, how to work this thing, because I've never been on a typewriter. I come from only computers. So I think that was, you know, a shock to them. But they proceeded to tell me how this, you know, was how women started their careers. And immediately I said, well, this isn't how I'm going to start my career. Uh, I told my mom, eh, I'm quitting. <laughs> That's it for me. And uh, she said, no, 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 just hold on, you know. Maybe you ought to call the Human Resources Office and just ask what other opportunities there are. So uh, I started doing that every day. <laughs> I was calling the HR office saying, hey, what, what else is out there? What can I do? Uh, I think they got so tired of hearing from me that they gave me a position in HR. Um, so I was a STEP student, GS4 HR assistant. Uh, while going for my degree in, in business administration. 
And uh, pretty quickly I, I learned that I, I, I really did love human resources. Um, uh, I hear a lot of, you know, talk about mentors today. And, uh, you know, for me, I had a mentor right away. Uh, my supervisor was a, a mid-career, uh, middle-aged uh, black male. Um, what, what that, why that is significant, I think, is because uh, he taught me so much about HR, but, you know, looking back, I was from this tiny little town, not exposed to anything, and really he exposed me to so much of life and, and struggles that I was otherwise very ignorant to. And so learning from him and watching how he uh, interacted and gave me a new perspective, which I think is really was really helpful um, then and, and certainly now. Um, uh, he encouraged me to take uh, different opportunities. I, I think he knew that I would always come back to HR, but I took the opportunity and worked in a facilities maintenance department uh, on Camp Pendleton where they were going through an A76 study and reduction in force. And, it did open my eyes. I, you know, when you're on one side of your career looking at how you push buttons and move uh, people around, and then I went to where the people actually saw, sat, and I saw, oh, my gosh, they're moving desk chairs, and it was, it was really impactful to see how human resources actually impacted people. It sounds kind of, um, you know, weird, but at, at that point in time, I didn't really understand what I was doing and how it was impacting uh, individual. So I, I realized, though, when I was in that administrative officer type of position that I didn't like any of the other work besides the human resources work. So I did uh, move back into human resources, uh, took an opportunity to um, uh, develop in human resources that is like a service center, and then followed uh, that same uh, boss when he got a position in Rota, Spain, uh, what an opportunity that was to be able to go work overseas for the Navy, and eventually the Army and back to the Pacific Northwest where I knew I wanted to be, um, and took a position with Fish and Wildlife. And uh, then shortly after that, I missed DOD uh, and, and got an opportunity to come, uh, you know, walk across the street and take a position with the Corps in January of 2013 in the same position that I'm in now. So, uh, you know, that was 2013. I was 30 uh, at that time, had two children, uh, had gone through 13 grade levels or, or 12 grade levels in 11 years with five different agencies, and, and what a whirlwind it was. But, uh, you know, I had this goal that I was going to get to the position I wanted to be in before my kids were school age so that we could, you know, stay in the same uh, school district and have kind of the, the luxury I felt I had staying with uh, one community the whole time. So I certainly met that goal. Um, but I think, you know, there's a few things I've probably learned and I just want to share a few pieces of advice that I'd, I'd want to give uh, you all. I think uh, number one, first and foremost, start with what you love. You can't go wrong. So for me, you know, I've had other opportunities where you look at moving to different career fields, like human resources is just what I love to do. So start with what you love. Um, no one else is going to manage your career, right? So you've got to set aside time to uh, manage your own career. Maybe not micromanage it like I did, <laughs> but, you know, managing uh, your career is, is, is what it's about. Uh, find mentors, and then don't be afraid to, to change it up with mentors. I remember when I first came to the Corps, I was assigned uh, a mentor, and I had one conversation with her and realized this isn't going to work out. But quite frankly, looking back on it now, it's probably we were too much alike. But, uh, you know, I went out and sought, sought a, a different mentor who has been a, a long-time great asset to me. And so... Realizing when it doesn't work as far as mentors is, is also really good. And a mentor on this call, uh, who's going to speak later, actually gave me the next piece of advice, which, you know, there is no right or wrong decision. There's only your decision. So you know what's right for you. Um, 
you can always listen to other uh, aspects and get, uh, you know, the most information you can to make decisions, but you know what's right for you. And I think uh, the lesson for me, too, is, you know, don't forget balance. There's there's a, there's going to be opportunities. I think Nicole, when she said, "Don't be afraid to say no," I think that's that's very important, and that you can you can have drive and balance. You just got to really be mindful um, of both. Um, and then you know the core is all about metrics, and I, I I laugh at that, but guess what? One of the best things is is that you get to fi- define your metric for success. So. Um, you want to remember that, that success is not always the same. It isn't the same for anybody. And so what you see as success is, is your metric, and you get to, to drive that. Um, and then I wanted to mention what I think I'm most proud of, although I saw some of the chat uh, message that there's lots more work to do in this, is that just coming in as a student intern, I think, you know, anything I can do, and I, I've tried to do since I've been at NWD to influence uh, intern programs has been kind of that pay it back type of um, opportunity that has really given me a sense of accomplishment in trying to forward those entry level opportunities to, to bring in uh, students because that's how I was brought in. And I, I think a lot, I heard some others on this call today, that's how they were uh, brought in, and so I think that's one area where I can look at how NWD has utilized the intern program, which a couple districts when I came in 2013 didn't um, utilize the program, the DA intern program at all. And so looking at how that's uh, changed and grown over the eight years I've been here has been something that uh, I'm really uh, happy about and to hopefully provide opportunities for others, and uh, we'll keep progressing. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly Doherty. She's our um, uh, resource manage, manager for NWD. And uh, like Mona said, I have been very blessed to be able, when we were in an office uh, situation, to sit right next to RM, who has taught me a little bit about, you know, about the money, and it is so valuable. And um, Kelly has taking me under her wing and also always included HR since we're a very small office with RM. So I'm much appreciative and uh, happy to introduce Kelly Doherty, please. Thanks, Kate. Yeah, I think you took me under your wing. I know how this team thing works, right? So I was talking to my RM team earlier, right? And they said, whatever you do, don't try to be too funny. Don't try to be too witty and don't try to be too smart. Just just be yourself. What? Yeah, my my RN team, they support. Um, so you know, I'll be quick, but just save the best to last, right? Well, maybe not last, but next to last. Um, so how does a girl from Branson, Missouri, living on the lake, hating the Corps of Engineers because I can't cut down a tree? I can't put out a dock, you know, they're all over me. And all I ever heard was, oh, the core is bad. End up working for the great organization that I do and being the highest financial professional within the region. It's, it's a great honor and it's a great organization. Um, it comes from all the hard work of those that have come before me, right? Um, they have laid the path of success. Looking at the St. Louis brochure that Beth handed out, I mean, I went through that brochure and still found three people from across the country that have influenced my career. Right? It is a small world, and that is one great thing about you states is that, you know, we are a family, as is the Army, right? It is a small world. Um, my career, in a nutshell, um, so one score and seven years ago, I found myself at Fort Knox, Kentucky, young, an associate's degree, just married. How do I get a federal career? Unlike you, or you, I took tests. I took three civil service tests. Yes, I'm dating myself, thank you. And I scored 100% on two of them just to be a GS3 
file clerk. Of course, I was not selected, right? But I was selected. I thought I had everybody beat because I was selected as a GS2, but Kate had to come in, right, and label the GS2. But I was selected as a GS2, but I was intermittent. Yeah, go ahead and cry. I was intermittent. So that he would call me at any point in time and say, please come scan these groceries at the commissary. Because that's what I qualified by taking the civil service exam was to be a GS2 sales store checker. And as a military spouse, as Judy was, right, that was getting my foot in the door. It's been a lot of years traveling with my husband across the country, making home and spending a lot of time as a GS4. But I never let go of my college aspirations. Uh, similar to uh, others that have spoken is that, you know, education is important. And so I continued to uh, accumulate college courses everywhere I went. Um, there was one really lucky break I had when I was in Alaska. So I knew I knew Joanne Welch or somewhere. When I was in Alaska, I was in Fairbanks and I got offered a DA intern position. Um, the lucky thing for me is the interview was on the phone and I was eight months pregnant. So when I showed up two weeks later, having gotten the job, um, there was a lot of controversy from the male supervisor that had hired me. Unfortunately, he hired me. So it is what it is, right? And I also, you know, later down the path, um, had had an opportunity um, about 12 years later for him to interview for a position working for me. So, you know, things um, come full circle, come full circle. Um, so um, that DA intern slot paid off. Eventually, I did get to go work for Alaska District. I learned a lot, had a lot of great mentors. And one of my sage advice that I would give is, I know Bono would agree, as I've seen some in the chat, is, you know, the LDP programs are an opportunity that you shouldn't pass up. They are not even on the district level, but at the regional level, they make a difference. Uh, they help you learn. And one of the sage advice I got is learning all the pieces. Like Mona said, even the money piece and the HR piece and the PM piece. Putting all those pieces together, it helps do that. And I think that's an extremely important part. And one of the other things that I would share with, you know, young leaders that are coming up in the organization is that, you know, it takes a team to get things done. And, and sometimes it's even doing the littlest of things or things you might find below yourself to get that project across the line. And that's why, no matter if it's shredding or copying, I think it's a matter of teamwork to get there. And the last thing that I will leave you with, because I'm being short and sweet, is that learn to accept criticism. Sometimes it's hard, but otherwise, how can you learn to improve? And so it's it's all about the way you can take it in, learn from it, grow from it, and not repeat it. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ms. Coffey. Well, thank you, Kelly. Um, I, I said in the chat room, but it, it must be the Missouri team being the closer team today. So, um, <laughs> so go show me state. Um, as you can see, um, there are many similarities in, in the stories that you've heard today, and I hope, you know, you've found, for those who have joined us today, something that you can take away to help yourself or to help others. Um, and like I said at the beginning, we'll have this recorded, and so it is something that if you're a supervisor and you want to share it with your staff that may not have been uh, available today, it'll be a tool for you. Um, you know, to, to use after this event. And I also just want to say one of the things that we were looking at is, you know, how to do more of these types of platforms as we move forward. And so stay tuned. 
um, there might be some things in the future that will be coming uh, to NWD uh, and in uh, the virtual platform to, to kind of really encourage this type of dialogue. So I guess it's my story now. Um, I've worked for the core for over 30 years. Um, like several folks, I started, I think as a GS3 uh, co-op. Um, and, you know, I, I, I had the, just, you know, Mona talked about luck. And I think that luck and opportunity is something that, you know, kind of got me started. I, you know, I started as a co-op and, you know, I worked in construction. I went from construction to engineering. Um, and then I went to project management. Um, Mona actually took a leap of faith and hired me as a GS13 planner. Uh, we still don't really know why, but she did it. <laughs> and, you know, and I had the, the great opportunity to kind of learn from her, uh, not only about money, but about planning. And, and then I went to operations, uh, first into regulatory and then ultimately into the chief of operations. Um, I just, you know, I've worked in a lot of different offices. I, from St. Louis to Seattle to the Portland division. And I think that within my journey, I think there's a couple of different themes that I just want to highlight today. I think first is that willingness to try. And you've heard that from a lot of other folks today. I think second is the stubbornness slash perseverance, you know, um, to get through things. The third thing is, is always having a mentor and, and then giving back and mentoring others. And the last thing is um, to stay resilient. You know, I, I started my journey, um, you know, my mother was definitely inspirational, like she heard mothers being inspirational to others. Um, she was a school teacher and she really wanted something different for her daughter. And, you know, she used to do continuing education um, uh, classes and she came back from one of them all excited with this brochure about, I think it was about hydrology and limnology. And she's like, look, see, you can go be a civil engineer and, you know, and take your love of science and, you know, become an engineer and go do that career. Because so I think she was really worried that I was going to go get a marine biology degree and then end up being a marine biology teacher. Um, so um, I was, you know, pretty impressionable. I was in high school and I'm like, sure, why not? And, and so I, you know, went to engineering school. Um, and that's where I think that I, before I knew really what SIONS was, I was, you know, trying something new and unknown that I wasn't really sure about. And that took all of my stubbornness and perseverance to get through at times, um, but I did. And then, you know, coincidentally, I ended up in ROTC class. It's like their 101 class really is a recruiting class just because it's the only thing you can take um, halfway through a semester and uh, still keep full-time credits if you've dropped a course. And I had another opportunity where they were offering a program where I could uh, get a reserve only contract, so I never had to go active duty. I could either be a guard or reservist and I could go intern with a DOD agency. And it seemed like a great opportunity. I got support for tuition and, and room and board, plus I got to go do this great opportunity as an intern, and that's where I chose the Corps of Engineers uh, St. Louis District and, and working in, in the, on an active construction site um, on the Mississippi River. And I think I probably learned more on that active construction site about civil engineering than sometimes I did in my civil engineering classes, but that's, you know, that's all good too. Um, but it was just, you know, a, you know, great opportunity for me to, you know, learn and grow. And when I graduated from college, I was lucky in the fact that uh, I got a call literally weeks after graduation from the Corps of Engineers and saying, hey, do you want to come work for us? And so I, um, at that moment in time, started two careers. I, I was in the um, Army National Guard and I was working for the Corps of Engineers. And I've been doing dual career for the last 28 uh, plus years. Um, and I think, you know, those two careers have really helped me uh, with the things that I'm going to talk about next um, because they gave me the opportunity for, to learn from both of my careers, to learn how to be a leader, how to work with, you know, diverse group of people. Um, I got a lot of that exposure on my Army side, and then I could take that and I could apply it, you know, to my core job. 
and or I would learn techniques from my core job and apply it to my Army job. And so it was really very um, beneficial for both of those careers, um, you know, trying to, um, to learn and grow from them. You know, for me, I, um, you know, as I work through my career in both of both sides, both do career, that willingness to try was really, I think, um, part of my, I feel like, foundational success. You know, I always, we've heard from a lot of people that you've got to manage your career, um, you've got to find that diversity, find those opportunities. Well, for me, I was somewhat mobility constrained for most of my career with my husband's career kind of taking us from Missouri to Washington State. So I was in Seattle District, and I knew I needed to do change, and I needed to learn and grow. And that's where my willingness to try, I think, really helped me. Um, I can still remember having one of my fellow leadership development program um, cohort come to me one day and say, hey, can you do this project? It's called Chief Joe um, uh, flow deflectors, we need you to do this, you know, feasibility study. I had no idea about how to do a feasibility study, but I'm like, well, sure, let me talk to my boss and I'll go see. And, uh, and my boss, Howard Blood at the time, was like, well, can you handle it with your current workload? And I'm like, mm, yeah, I think so. I think I can do that. Um, and I did. And But it kind of opened the door. I mean, I think, you know, Mona and I have talked about this many years later, because I said yes to that project, she said yes to me later on when, you know, when I applied for a job with her. So it's taking those opportunities and sometimes, sometimes it's just trying to, you know, that willingness to try and, and then asking the question. We always get hampered by the fact, oh, I don't know if my supervisor is going to let me do that. Well, if you don't ask, you've already given yourself the answer, which is no. If you ask, you have a 50-50 chance that they're going to say yes or they're going to say no. So why not go for the 50-50 chance? And, and try to see if you can, you know, do, take that opportunity. Because um, I think you, a lot of times we'll be surprised that people will give you that opportunity to try. You know, I think that, you know, I kind of used that, you know, throughout my career, um, trying new opportunities. Um, I still remember going to regulatory, and um, I think it was Les Soul from Seattle District was like, why are you going to regulatory? I'm like, because I want to become a supervisor. And it's a supervisory opportunity, and I'm going to go apply for it. And again, they took a risk and said, "Well, we're not sure about her. She doesn't have any, you know, regulatory background, but sure, we'll hire her." And it was a great experience. It exposed me to that whole world. Um, I got to, you know, really find what, you know, what it meant to be a supervisor. You know, I'd done supervisory on the military side, but I hadn't done it on the civil uh, civilian side, so it really opened my eyes to, you know, what that really meant. And, you know, I just kept that kind of attitude moving through my career of trying to do new things. And I think as I developed my career, I was also looking at how do I give back to the organization? How do I help the organization, you know, be a better place? And I think as I went forward in my career between becoming a branch chief and a division chief and to this position, it's really always been about, okay, what can I do to make the organization better and, and trying to bring my experiences to the table um, as much as I can, but also bring in, uh, you know, everybody else's experiences to the table and trying to, you know, bring that, you know, that group of uh, for folks together to be a diverse team is really what, you know, is success for the core. I mean, everything we do in this organization is a team sport. You know, and we don't do anything by ourselves and working together with all of our backgrounds and experiences and knowledge is really how, you know, we move things forward. So moving, you know, from there, I just wanted to talk about, you know, the, you know, part of willingness to try is also being able to be stubborn enough and persevere that there's going to be things you don't know and you just got to figure out how to get over those obstacles. And it's whether it's bringing somebody else in to help you with that or just, you know, nugging through it and trying to, to get through the issue. So you got to have some amount of like, I'm going to do this no matter what it takes attitude to really to move forward and to keep that, you know, um, that motivation going. But I did, as I said, you know, this is not as a team sport and we don't do it alone. And, and you've heard from many folks today about the importance of mentoring and, you know, I've, 
been fortunate, like many folks on this um, uh, webinar today, of having great supervisors that were probably some of my strongest mentors. But then I also had, you know, I found mentors along the way, um, you know, and, and people that really, you know, taught me a lot of things that I now, you know, try to teach others. Um, as some of you who still may, who may know, um, who have mentored with me, I occasionally, maybe more frequently, will draw a little let it go button for you. And, and that came from one of my best mentors, Kathy Coons. Kathy was like, she was just like, all right, you just got to get, you know, let this stuff go and you got to move forward. And, and she just would, took a sticky note and she wrote, drew a circle, wrote in there, let it go, and she's like, you push this every single time, you're letting stuff weigh you down. <laughs> and it worked. It was a mental exercise, but it worked and it helped me to move forward. So having a mentor or mentors, you know, you know, to surround you and to help you is, is really important. And I just encourage everybody that if you don't have a mentor right now, um, you've got a, a panel of folks that are on this call that would love to help you find you know, a mentor, um, using our network of people to connect you with somebody um, to try to help fill that gap for you. The other piece of that is to be a mentor and to, you know, that, you know, giving back kind of mentality and whether it's, you know, mentoring your peers, you know, actually having a, a mentoring relationship with somebody, or sometimes it's even mentoring your boss, um, you know, I, I got some of the best advice sometimes from my, um, you know, employees, you know, providing mentoring to me about, you know, how I could be a better supervisor and a better leader for them. And so mentoring doesn't have to be top down or, you know, lateral. It could be bottom up too. So it's, it's really just, you know, encouraging the conversation and, and letting it happen. The last thing I just want to talk about is resiliency. I think that, for me, you know, we've got to take care of ourselves. And if anything, this year has taught us that that's a really important thing for us to do. And I think that we've all got to figure out what that means, you know, from a personal level, you know, what keeps you resilient and what keeps you healthy, both mentally and physically, emotionally. And, you know, I, we talked a lot, we've talked a lot for years about work-life balance, and that's a part of it. But it's really just having that inward resiliency that can get you through the high moments and the low moments and, and keep you moving forward. And so whether that is, you know, working out, whether that is, you know, you know, making sure you eat a healthy diet, whether that is making sure you laugh every day, whether it's, you know, having um, quality time by yourself or with your family, or a combination of all those different things, figuring out what what it takes to be resilient and what it you know takes to keep yourself healthy is I think it's really important, and we all need to you know look in the mirror every once in a while and just say, okay, do I feel like I'm taking care of myself? Because if I'm taking care of myself, I'm going to be better at being a leader at work or a coworker or a, a, a wife or a friend. You know, I'm, I'm going to be able to help others and help myself, you know, if I'm in a good spot. And so for me, I personally, you know, I, I know I need to work out on a regular basis, right? You know, that is something that gives me, you know, that resiliency. I know that I need to have downtime, that, you know, one of the things with having a dual career is that I've always told people for years that you never want to, you know, come to my office on a Friday afternoon after I've had the previous weekend been in re head reserve training. So that second, that second week of working, you know, two weeks straight, I'm pretty much spent. <laughs> and so, you know, having that break is something that you need, you know, I need to have. Um, you know, another thing is vacation. Uh, I was thinking about it the other day. I don't think I've ever had use or lose, ever. In my whole 30 plus career, I have never had use or lose because vacations are important because it gives me that mental break and I know I need to, to take that. And so, you know, making sure you take care of yourself and um, keep that resiliency and helps you, I think, when you come to work, to be all there. And, 
and I just encourage everybody to, to think about that. Um, you know, I'll leave you kind of on one last, two last thoughts on kind of resiliency. Uh, I remember doing resiliency training through the Army at one point in time, and one thing that always stuck with me was the um, comment of hunt for the hunt for the good stuff. And so I really encourage everybody to every day hunt for that good stuff. You know, think of something that's good that happened during the day or good in your life that just makes you smile. Um, I also leave you with just the the thought of you know laughter and and smiling really are very beneficial. And I encourage each of you to you know make somebody smile or make somebody laugh each day um, and laugh yourself because that will also give you those nice good endorphins and and help you to stay healthy and, and stay resilient. So again, be willing to try, persevere, aka stubbornness, help others and yourself um, through mentoring and take care of you. So again, thank you for this panel of, of women from around the division. It's been great to hear everybody's stories and um, I really appreciate everybody that called in and 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 listen to us and listen to our stories. And again, I hope that you can take something from this um, this time with us and and take it back into your life, to your family, to your coworkers, uh, to your employees, and, and be beneficial. So, so thanks again, and we'll conclude this Women's History Brown Bag, take two.